now it's my distinct honor to welcome to uh, the floor here, Melody Moisey, a writer, activist, attorney, professor, and award-winning author. Her latest book is The Rumi Prescription, for which she won a 2021 Wilbur Award. Her other books include the critically acclaimed memoir Hadal and Hyacinths, A Bipolar Life, and War on, uh, and War on Error, Real Stories of American Muslims. She's appeared as a commentator on major news media outlets, and her writing has been published in prominent newspapers and journals. She appeared, uh, or she is currently a visiting associate professor of creative writing at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, and I know firsthand that she uh, she loves her students because she's teaching them, and they're getting better every day. And we're going to talk today all about uh, Melody and her experience by way of connecting her with my other or my colleague, Andy Engel, who is our program lead at Reimagine. And Andy has really done so much to put together all of these vigils. The programming that you see in many respects is due to Andy's great work, uh, bringing guests to the space, to holding the space for all of us, to designing so much of this. And Andy specifically wanted to chat with Melody today. So I'm gonna let Andy and Melody take it away to, to really uh, hold the space for all of us and, and make this vigil uh, come to life. Thank you, Brad. Melody, it's so nice to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm trying to still see everyone. Can I still do that while we're talking? Yeah, I, I think so. See every yes, I just did it. Um, and Melody, we're in the midst of Ramadan, and I suspect most of us here gathered, you know, uh, know that this is a month of fasting for observant Muslims. From what I've read about you, you're somewhat of an unorthodox Muslim, <laughs> let's say. Um, and, but, you know, with the fasting, you know, I, 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 I was wondering if you could share with us, you know, you know, we know that fasting happens during Ramadan, but why are people fasting during Ramadan? Yeah, I mean, it's a time of spiritual reflection um, and also to, have, have a sense of what those who have less than you uh, deal with every day. Uh, for people like me, who the plenty of people with disabilities or uh, medical conditions who can't fast, uh, there's also, you can replace that with a certain amount of charity, uh, which is what, what I do because I had a pancreatic tumor. It's probably, it's not good for my, half my pancreas. That's my argument. I don't know. I have a friend who has one kidney and fasts, which I'm still trying to convince her to stop. I feel like at least the water, I just want her to drink water, but uh, you're not supposed to if, if you can't, but it's not just fasting. Actually, like that's the easy part is not eating um, food. The hard part is for me is um, not talking about other people behind their back. So backbiting, for instance, not lying. Um, <laughs> Uh, the more, the things that you can't see, uh, but the things that we do every day. Uh, and sort of, it's funny because my Islam is very uh, integrated with a, a sense of Persian identity and culture as an Iranian. Uh, and so there's a Zoroastrian influence as well uh, for me. And that notion, the Zoroastrian notion of good deeds, good thoughts, and good actions uh, is the same notion that underlies uh, why we celebrate uh, Ramadan, but specifically, it's the month that the Quran was revealed to the uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, uh, from the angel Gabriel. So it was that miracle uh, that we're celebrating right now. So Ramadan Kareem, and also Nauruz Mubarak. Merci, um, thank you. Um, so. In Farsi, I know, I know I, it means, literally means new day. Um, and um, I'm curious if you could tell us more about this Persian holiday. Yeah, so uh, we just celebrated Nowruz, which is the vernal equinox, uh, which is our Pers the new year in Iran. Even with the so-called Islamic Republic, I say so-called because it's impossible to be uh, the a theocracy and be Islamic at the same time because you have to give people intention and choice. It's against Islam to, to force religion on people. But in any case, even in that state, even in the so-called Islamic Republic, we still have 
the calendar, the Zoroastrian calendar. We still use that calendar. We're not on the uh, Islamic calendar. Uh, so our new year makes sense. <laughs> I mean, I, I love all new years. I'm, I'm embracing all new years, but it makes so much more sense because everything is coming to life. Uh, and so there are people all over the world who celebrate this. Uh, originally, it's a Zoroastrian tradition. Uh, so thousands of years uh, we've been doing this. And uh, it's just parts of Western Central Asia um, caucuses in the Balkans, I hear, even. So yeah, so people celebrate it all over the world. And it, it makes sense to me to have a new year when we experience spring. Yes, and there are also parallels, you know, I'm going to be preparing this week, cleaning my house for Passover, you know, yeah. <laughs> spring holiday. So, and we've got Easter. So, um, um, yes, we invented, let me just get, take credit here. We invented oh, okay. Easter, the Easter egg. We, that's us. We did that. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to take full credit for that while, while, while I can. You can take it. Um, and it's also National Poetry Month and how appropriate that we've got you here talking about the Rumi prescription, um, which I have right here. I encourage everyone to read this. This is a fantastic book. Um, and now I'm gonna ask my, the obvious question, because I've been asking about Ramadan, Nawuz. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Rumi. Um, Rumi is a 13th century Persian Sufi poet, mystic, legal scholar. He's not given enough credit for that. Uh, he is the first of the so-called whirling dervishes. Uh, he composed his poetry. A lot of his poetry was composed in sort of ecstatic states while reciting it and whirling. Um, and he, for his masterpiece, the Mass Navi is an epic poem of more than 25,000 rhyming couplets. Uh, he also has Divana Shams, which is, uh, Ruwai, uh, quatrains and Ghazals. Um, but the Mass Navi, I, I pulled for the book, I pulled a lot from the Mass Navi that I pulled mainly from what my dad has taught me. So I grew up uh, like a lot of Iranians, like a lot of um, people who speak Persian uh, or Farsi as it's also known. So uh, this poetry is just like in our blood. <laughs> like, so my dad is a big fan of uh, Sufi poetry in general. So Hafez as well, Saadi, other Sufi poets, but specifically Rumi is his favorite. Um, and so this was my way of getting to know my dad better, um, understanding like going onto his turf. I'm not a poet. I don't enjoy poetry in the same way that he does at all. Um, I, I love parts of like, there's, there's beautiful poems. I, I appreciate poetry and music, like in terms of what gets to my heart. Um, I think there's a capacity for music that I've not experienced in any sort of writing, which sucks because I'm a writer. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not at all musical, but um, I can't uh, like create music. I can listen really well, but um, never been good at creating it. But I find that is where I connect uh, mostly with like the divine spirit within myself and everyone else. Uh, whereas my dad, for him, it's through this poetry that he grew up reciting and he, when I grew up, then recited every lesson I ever learned was accompanied by a poem. And I was well, that for a long time, <laughs> but, but we'll as I grew about, up, I realized the wisdom of it. It took a while. <laughs> we'll talk about your dad soon. Um, I do want to talk about your previous book, um, Hal Dahl and Hyacinths. Um, you know, it's a memoir, um, for those who don't know, documenting all these health crises, all these yeah. health adversities that you've dealt with. Some major, you talked about your, your pancreas, you had yeah. surgery on that, um, a suicide attempt, um, a misdiagnosis, then a diagnosis for bipolar disorder, stays in psychiatric hospitals, um, and then all this pressure to keep this stuff a secret. Um, yeah. And I want to ask you, how did these experiences, um, these adversities, um, help you in any way appreciate um, some of this, yeah. this, this poetry that you and your dad uh, had been uh, learning together? Yeah, so um, 
this this poetry i never made sense to me so much like it's all about love um which i i am all about like justice and grew up, and justice is love just expanded right but i experienced it differently because my notion of justice was really rooted in anger um so in terms of what when i really woke up to the power of rumi's poetry it wasn't until i had a manic episode and a psychotic break that was also accompanied by a mystical experience, uh, both of which were valid. Um, I needed medication. It was a clinical condition I needed medication for. And I thank God that that medication was available to me. It was also a spiritual experience that I thank God for as well. Um, that I, if you haven't experienced, had a mystical experience, um, it's akin to how I've heard people describe psychedelic experiences. So sort of recognizing that we're all one, that we're all connected. Um, every living thing is connected. And it's, it's it was a beautiful experience until I was burnt by it. And uh, then it was psychosis. Um, I don't recommend it. I would not want to go through it. I wouldn't undo it. I, I wouldn't control alt whatever the undo is. But I, I definitely uh, am grateful for it. it may, it's made me uh, who I am and it's allowed me to not question the existence of any divine presence in a way that I was, I was very intellectually capable of questioning that before that mystical experience. I am not capable of doing that anymore. There's no, because I've experienced it. It's like, if I've, you know, I've been to Japan and you can't tell me that Japan doesn't exist because <laughs> I've been there. Um, like there's, once you go somewhere, it's there, you know? So it's just uh, that divinity is so obvious to me because I was able to intuit it. And as somebody who like everything I've accomplished in my life has been very much like up until this point, very much through intellect, uh, it was a hard moment for me to lose my mind. Uh, and then to do it so publicly <laughs> was not fun uh, either. But what Rumi says, he has a poem where he says, uh, man bar siram as farhangi o farzanagi. Um, and my translation of that is in love with insanity, I'm fed up with wisdom and rationality. And it's not a direct translation. He actually says in love with the profession of insanity. Um, so this is where Rumi made sense to me all of a sudden when I lost my mind, because I understood what he encourages. So Rumi recognizes two different kinds of insanity. There's the kind of insanity uh, that brings people together that is rooted in love. And that's the kind that he promotes. And then there is the kind of insanity that is rooted in fear and tears people apart and is rooted in extremism. That's where you get extremism and fundamentalism, but it's rooted in fear. So it's, you have this option for him, everyone's crazy. So it's not like we have an option, but the option is do the love crazy or do the fear crazy. Um, and I mean, we're very much living in a world of fear crazy. Um, and I would, and my effort as an activist, as a writer, as a human being has been to, to move us more toward the love side of that. Um, one poem in particular, um, I was struggling with a poem about hospitality. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I, we welcome people. This is sort of a natural thing. You know, I'm welcoming you here to our vigil. I'm welcoming everyone here who's attending. Um, and here's what Rumi has to say. Um, welcome every guest, no matter how grotesque. Be as hospitable to calamity as to ecstasy, to anxiety as to tranquility. Today's misery sweeps your home clean, making way for tomorrow's felicity. And this is your translation, yes? Yeah. Um, I'm finding it very difficult to get behind the notion of hospitality vis-a-vis uh, -vis adversity. You know, I, I might open my door to hard stuff in life. Um, I might let it come in, but... Um, I don't think I can be so gracious as a host. Uh, I'm not gonna offer um, pistachios like your dad does. Um, and, or, not, or nuna, nuna paneer, uh, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> that um, um, or other Persian delicacies. So can you tell us 
what it means to you to welcome guests like suicidal ideation mm -hmm. and bipolar disorder. Yeah. Um, it means not running away from discomfort uh, and as and to actually feel it. Uh, Rumi is not one of those like positive, like he, he's, he's not all about be positive and everything will be okay. He's about feel what you feel um, and everything is already okay. Mm -hmm. Everything is already the way it needs to be. He has a poem where he says, which means you went out in search of gold far and wide, but all along you were gold on the inside. Uh, and that is my mantra when I am in a moment of anxiety or any, like the, the welcome every guest. I also have these issues because <laughs> there's exactly welcoming negativity into your life. Like if you see it that way, then that's fine. Go ahead and see it that way. And we frequently talk about mental illness in terms of demons and things like that, uh, which is so unfortunate because I have met more mystics on psychiatric units than anywhere else uh, I've ever been. And I've, I taught in psychiatric units. So not just as a patient, I taught for two years on a locked psychiatric unit. And I will tell you, I met mystics on that ward um, who needed medication, but also needed love and uh, only got one side of that. Um, and I felt like that was exactly what I got as well as I got, I got the medication. I didn't get the validation that what I was experiencing was real in terms of the spiritual uh, side of things. I'm curious, you know, more about these mystics that you met on the ward. Can you tell us maybe a story or two about mm -hmm. these? Yeah, I, I taught uh, writing workshops and you, you got to think that when you're in a psychiatric hospital, this is a, the worst moment of your life. I mean, for most people. Um, I had some pretty bad moments. I almost died before. Like I had a pancreatic tumor that nearly killed me when I was a teenager. My first admission after a suicide attempt uh, was in my 20s. And that was, I, I thought my life was over. It was during my last semester, my last year of law school, um, which will give you a sense of, uh, I always say like how irrational suicide is. It's not a rational choice because if it were a rational choice, of course, you would not do it the last semester of your last year of law school. You would do it the first semester of your first year. You would not go through all that shit. To, like just to attempt suicide at the end. At the end of it, it was I was an out of body experience, and that's why it bothers me so much when people put blame in a way that I don't think you. Nobody blames someone for dying of cancer. Um, and for me, I had an untreated medical condition and it and not just untreated badly treated because as you mentioned i was misdiagnosed so i was misdiagnosed like so many people the majority of people it takes about eight to ten years to get a proper diagnosis of bipolar uh and i was misdiagnosed with unipolar depression and given medication that actually made my symptoms worse uh so if you're given an antidepressant without a mood stabilizer uh you can go manic and that's exactly what happened is i, I went manic uh, as a result of that and i've only thank god had one manic episode. Uh, I've only experienced true like psychosis once. I mean, it, it depends how you talk about delusions and, or hallucinations. I've only had delusions once. Um, uh, but they're also the delusions are based in your personality too, in some ways. And, and that's also a throw, like the medical community throws that away too. Um, in a way I was like the things that I was trying to do were not rational on this realm and on this level, but I think I had access to another reality that is just as valid, but is not convenient or like does not work where we live. Um, and I had access to that different realm and it, it didn't look good to people on this, on this level. Um, and I, again, like I just, you can't live like that. And that, that's what happens for mystics. Like the whole goal of a mystic is the annihilation of the ego. We call that fana the, in Sufi mysticism. Um, so the annihilation of the ego, that's what I experienced briefly, um, but you can't live without an ego. <laughs> you can't live without a sense of self because but before the divine presence, there's no me and you. There's, there's us, there's just us. Um, but you can't walk around the world like that. We, our world is not meant for people like that, which is why we get thrown in psychiatric hospitals and uh, told to lower our expectations for our life and all other such nonsense. 
you, you, you're mentioning fauna, and I remember reading about this in the Rumi prescription and how it's necessary to have a guide. Mm. And I, I immediately thought of your dad, you know, as that guide. Um, tell me more about that. Yeah, this is something I fought. I, I call myself an anarchist because <laughs> I hate the idea of a guide. I hate it because so many, mo many charismatic old white guys have used that to control people. And I feel like that's that's how you start a cult too. Um, and I, I, so I was, it's a very dangerous thing. And I, I, I still don't think everyone needs a guide in the same way. Um, but for me, it turned out that my guide was a human being in my life. And I trusted this person, which happened to be my father. And I, I am not an easy person. Like I don't trust people easily. I couldn't have like run off to some country I've never lived in and found some guru to lead me like that. That would not have worked for me. I'm too much of a cynic and a skeptic uh, for that to work. So, uh, but my father, he was he was a really um, useful and uh, obvious, obvious guide for me. And I was very lucky that he just happened to be, not just that he just happened to be my father, but he happened to still be alive when I came to my senses and realized, I, again, lost my mind in order to realize that what he was saying, what Rumi was saying, like that was true. And for me, having had an entire career that was led by anger, uh, every book I wrote was based on how angry I was. My first book was about young Muslim Americans. I was angry about Islamophobia. That's why I wrote it. Um, my second book was about having bipolar disorder. I was angry about ableism and sanism. That's why I wrote it. Um, my third book, was my way of saying, okay, I was so angry for so long. And I don't doubt that carrying that anger contributed to the mental health crisis that ultimately earned me my bipolar diagnosis. So um, I'm sure there are other factors for sure. Uh, but I think carrying around that much anger for so long uh, was one of the factors. And so Rumi teaches to, uh, my activism hasn't changed. I still do the same, I'm still an activist. But it's instead of out of hatred for the oppressor, it's out of love for the oppressed. Mm -hmm. um, and ideally, you get to the point that you even have love for the oppressor, um, because that's the person who is lacking it the most. Um, and that's, that's why there's a sense of insecurity that causes somebody to, to do that to somebody else. Uh, that is harder for me. It's a lot easier for my dad. I'm still, I'm, it's just, anger still comes much more naturally to me than, than love. I'm well, there's like, a lot to be angry about in terms of, you know, mental health right now and mental illness. You know, I was reading according to the UN, more than one in 10 people are living with a mental health condition at any one time, and many are not getting um, community-based holistic support. They're still being locked up and institutionalized. Um, and can you elaborate from your, you know, your knowledge and experience, you know, why more, why, why mental health is yeah. a human rights issue? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And I, I think it's important to know that we in this, in the United States, those of us who are in the United States, we use solitary confinement um, more than any other country on the planet. We use it as treatment and punishment despite the fact that there is evidence to show, tons of evidence to show that it's actually counterproductive. Uh, it actually induces symptoms of mental illness in people who don't already have it. Um, so it's a great way to go crazy. It's not a great way to treat crazy. Uh, and in my second book, I compare it to giving laxatives to somebody to treat diarrhea, 100%. <laughs> like, that is exactly what we are doing. Um, it is cruel and inhumane, and I've only experienced it for 24 hours of my life, and I'm convinced that it is incredibly, like, the moment of my life when I felt so connected to everyone else on earth, where I had that mystical experience, within 24 hours, I was in a psychiatric hospital locked in isolation. They call it isolation or segregation or seclusion. There's all these euphemisms for it, uh, but I call it solitary confinement because that's what it is, uh, and it, it, I experienced it as punishment, absolutely, and it made me crazier and worse. Uh, and I would, I, I would beg any psychiatrist before they impose solitary confinement on somebody, before they impose 
five point restraints, which they also used on me. Uh, they're still using in the 21st century. Um, there's, I mean, there's chemical restraints, like there's medications that work very fast, but I was in five point restraints. Like you put somebody in five point restraints, they very quickly become the kind of person who belongs in five point restraints. Like that's the way that you, you create somebody like that. And I, I just can't imagine taking that level of agency away from somebody is the ultimate in cruelty. Cause for me, that's, I would, oppression is worse than killing. This is a direct quote from the Quran. Uh, and, and that kind of oppression is worse, like that genuinely is worse than killing, uh, because you're inducing like a kind of torture on somebody. And I, I'm convinced that like our mental health system is beyond broken. We've criminalized mental illness to the point that our largest mental health facilities are jails and prisons. And I'm incredibly lucky that I wasn't put in a jail. <laughs> Uh, that's where we treat most mental illness. And then our psychiatric hospitals, we don't have enough beds. And a lot of those are taken up by criminals who are in, who have already been convicted of crimes and are taking those beds. So that that's a criminal who's been convicted as opposed to someone in, in jail who has not been convicted of anything, uh, is awaiting trial. So like innocent until proven guilty, right? But we have a bail system that makes people guilty automatically. So that bail system all of that stuff is so related um, and it's impossible to tear it apart. Uh, so it's impossible, especially in this country to tear apart the criminal justice system from the so-called mental health system, but there's no mental health system, it doesn't exist. Um, we need to build it from the ground up and the people who are most impacted by it need to have a say in how that works. Because I think the moment you take away agency from somebody, they're not complying. Like that, I'm not, I don't care even out of spite. I will not comply when you, like I, I'm that kind of person. So it, it's just, it's, it was very hard for me to experience what I experienced in the psychiatric hospitals and also to witness other people experiencing that, which I knew were not just human rights violations, but civil rights violations, violations of federal law in the United, as a lawyer, I know this. Like I knew they were violating the law, but I couldn't stop it. Um, and I just, I've never felt more desperate and powerless in my entire life. And I hope that in my work that I can bring a voice to people who are locked in solitary right now, whether it's in prison or in a psychiatric facility, which again, there's not necessarily a difference in this country. Um, that there's, there are people suffering intensely, uh, who, who are locked in these, these units. Um, and those of us who are not there, like need to advocate for them because what like those of us who've experienced it especially um but it becomes hard because of the discrimination around having a mental illness so nobody wants to be public about having gone to a psychiatric hospital having experienced this kind of abuse because they don't even want to admit it right so for me it was important the first step was just to say i've been in a psychiatric hospital i have a diagnosed mental health condition um and i'm not going to be quiet about it because i as an activist i knew the minute somebody tells you to be quiet about something, it's because you have something important to say. Uh, so I knew that. I knew I had something important to say and I wasn't gonna shut up about it. Thank you for breaking these taboos, Melody. You know, you're, what you do with mental illness is so much of, is, of what Reimagine is trying to do about breaking taboos around death and dying and having conversations on mortality and all the hard stuff. And you know, we're in the midst now of this thematic season, this spring, uh, of grief, growth, and justice. That's what we've called it. And um, you, you're, you're such a perfect fit for this season. Um, and we're trying to find the relationship between what's known as post-traumatic growth, mm -hmm. um, transforming one's adversities into transformation and change and self-knowledge. Uh, we're trying to make those that, that connection to acts of service and justice work. And I'm curious about, you know, you mentioned before, you have taught um, in uh, psychiatric units. Um, and I'm just curious to learn more about uh, how acts of service and activism have played a role in your personal healing and growth. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, the, you asked me about stories and I, I didn't actually give you individual stories of people, mystics I've met in the hospital, but those people, um, I tell a story in, in the Rumi prescription about 
encountering uh, somebody who treated me badly for where I'm from and uh, my faith and my background, uh, a, a just a racist client. But I, I don't know. You can't judge somebody in the moment of their, their worst moment of their life. Uh, so I, I don't know this person, but I do know he had a Confederate flag tattooed on his arm and he uh, called me Al-Qaeda or some, something related to, anyway, um, it, was a, it was a bad experience and all the other, there was about seven patients there and like all the other patients who witnessed it, um, usually like I'm the person who, who says like, leave, leave us alone. Um, but when the health tech came to take him away, I was like, please take him. <laughs> yes, take him away. Um, it, it, it was abusive. And so when he was leaving, uh, one of the patients said, no, you need to apologize to Melody. And I was like, I don't need an apology. <laughs> I definitely don't need an apology. But then all the other patients stood up. And so there's like six patients standing up, like most of whom, this is my first workshop with them. I haven't said like, I maybe knew two of them from before and the rest of them I had just met that day. And they had all stood up and said, you need to apologize to her. And in the worst moment of their life, they were able to see somebody who was able to walk out, somebody who came in freely and was able, they couldn't get out, like to, who was able to walk out and they were defending me uh, in that moment. And it just gave me such a sense of hope um, that no matter how ignorant like people get, like there's a, a certain level of civility. And I will say like that group of six people, we didn't all politically agree on everything for sure. <laughs> I mean, I live in North Carolina. So like, we definitely were not all on the same page politically, but they knew decency. They, they knew that and they knew what was wrong. Uh, and they stood up for me in a way that like consistently I found these acts of service have given more back to me uh, than I, I could possibly ever imagine that I'm able to give to them. So yeah, that's been a huge part of my treatment is to be able to do that. And it's not an easy thing to do. Most people, I, I begged to teach for free inside of uh, the psychiatric hospitals. Uh, I initially approached a hospital where I had been a patient before and, and they said, absolutely not because you've been a patient. I'm like, that's what makes me so qualified <laughs> to be there. Uh, and you know, I've published books. It's not like I teach, I'm a professor. Like I'm teaching at a university. It's not like I'm just some random person. Um, wanting to teach writing workshops inside of psych facilities. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's so demoralizing, right? And dehumanizing, but that's how our system is. It's very paternalistic and it's all based on helping family members of people with mental illness and forgetting that like there are people with, <laughs> like we're actually human beings too. It's uh, yes, we have wonderful families and often they also have mental health conditions. So it's this creation of a them and us kind of mentality that is so not true. Uh, because anybody who's dealt with, like, who deals with a family member who has a mental health condition, deal with it long enough, and I promise you'll have one too. Like, it's not, it's not just, uh, it's not just us. It's it can't be us and them. It can't be, and I, that's what I'm also trying to fight is this sort of paternalistic mentality uh, that other people know what's best for us and can force us. Uh, in many states in the United States, they can force us to take medications against our will. Uh, definitely they can, everywhere they can force us when we're in the hospital, which to me, thank God they did. I am grateful to, for that. Uh, but when we're outside of the hospital, they call it assisted outpatient treatment. It's coerced treatment. Um, and it's forcing people to take medications that actually like you, you don't know it's, if it were diabetes and insulin, I'd be like, absolutely on board, you know? Uh, but if it's like bipolar and Zyprexa, which like Zyprexa has saved my life. I take it like once a year on average, uh, but I would be in the hospital if it weren't for this antipsychotic. Like, thank God for it. I'm grateful for antipsychotics. I don't need to take them every day in my life. Um, and as much as like there's a mental health crisis that people aren't being treated, people aren't being diagnosed, people are also being, I mean, think of the foster, I, I think of the foster care system, people are being over-medicated, um, given way too many diagnoses when, without un, like recognizing an underlying uh, diagnosis, which I, I just see that so commonly. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's so broken, but there's, there is hope in the patients. 
uh, if we would just take the stigma, which is again, a nice way of saying discrimination out from underneath so that we could actually speak up because we're the experts on this in terms of how, how to fix the system, but no one will listen to us. Perfect segue to my next question or topic. It's around expertise. Mm -hmm. um, in post-traumatic growth, psychologist Richard Tedeschi writes that a person suffering trauma, grief, loss, that person is the best expert about their own experience. And it's important to have an expert companion. Uh, we talked about the guide. This is yeah. an expert companion to support you on your journey towards healing and growth. And I think of it as a kind of a hajj, you know, it's, it's oh, not the Mecca, but towards your own transformation. So um, here are the qualities of what Tedeschi says is an expert companion. A person who listens to the worst, um, a person who learns from the survivor, um, a person who tolerates what may come across as idiosyncratic or bizarre. I'm not going to use the word crazy, only you can use that. <laughs> I, I, I own it, so I'm fine. Okay. Um, and a person who is there for the long haul. And the person who I thought of as the expert companion, it sounds a lot like your dad to me. It sounds like Ahmad. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm curious, how did Ahmad learn from you in these roomy study sessions? Yeah. Um, and how did your relationship evolve? Uh, yeah, so he, we're now more friends as well as, as a parent and child, which was not the case. Um, we have a strong connection, like we're very similar emotively, but, and he, he deals with depression as well. Uh, so we have that connection as well. But um, in terms of to take post-traumatic growth initially, like that notion is really important, uh, especially for immigrant communities to remember as much as people are demeaning us consistently. My parents are both immigrants from Iran. They're both physicians. They've saved lives in the United States, many lives. Um, that my dad has given birth to God knows how many babies. Um, and they, they have been repaid by, you know, the last 10 years, but I, this is their, this is their repayment for all that they've done, uh, for America, um, which gets into the next book that I'm writing. So I'm getting into the, the wrong one, but, um, that expert companion and like knowing that you're. This, this idea of post-traumatic growth is in, in our blood. So like we, I have survived war, my parents came here, they survived colonialism, British and American colonialism. They survived uh, war where you, the Iran, US was supporting Iraq uh, openly, Iran overtly so they could steal the oil out from under us. Uh, they, um, they survived and that, so that was war. They survived revolution. Um, and they made it here. So like this, so many immigrant stories are like this, that we, we forget what we've survived um, and what we come from. And so this reminder of what you come from, you come from stock that has survived this. Um, and I think we forget that. And if you come from stock that has survived and managed to make it, um, you're here for a reason. <laughs> um, and that stock is not, that that is valuable. Uh, and because over, um, you know, the past five years, six years, um, we've been told that, I mean, a long time, uh, that we're less than, um, we, we act differently. Like we, we don't know that for sure. And I personally, I wrote my first book after 9-11. And I thought I was living in New York at this time. I, and I was to fight Islamophobia. And I, I thought this is the worst it's ever going to get. It's never going to like, this is the worst. Like you can manage this. You can live in New York after 9-11. You can take this abuse. I didn't realize how much worse it would get. And that it would get to the point where I felt like, and I write about it in the book that like every news alert during Trump's administration just felt like it was like, Dear Melody, America hates you. Get back to work. Like <laughs> that was just like every news alert felt like that to me. 
um, as a reminder. And like, I, I just had never been reminded of it so frequently. Um, and I, and I, I grew up, I was born in 79. I was born the year of the so-called Islamic revolution. So like I, my entire life, my two homelands have been ultimate enemies. Uh, so I'm used to this, but I, it never got that bad. And I, my full belief is that it had to get that bad. I have to believe this because I, I can't survive otherwise that it had to get that bad for America to see. Because there were some Americans who were who were saying like, oh no, we're over this, we're past this. Why can't you know? We still haven't done reparations in this country. Like, are you kidding? Um, so that we're past it uh, is it, it had to. So this was the misery that had to sweep our home clean, making way for inshallah, God willing, um, a kind of felicity. And I even think COVID is also part of that, like being able to be disconnected to realize how much our connection matters uh, to one another, but. Yes, so you asked about my father and, and him being my guide. I'm very lucky for that and I'm very grateful. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that, that, that the book would not exist without that for sure. I just love this Ahmad quote that he, what he told you, you are not a mess, you are a miracle. Yeah. It gets me all for Clint. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, you know, you mentioned COVID just now, and uh, you know, you wrote this book before the pandemic, and you were very prescient about yeah. virology. Here's this my quote. Dad, my dad was very prescient about it, yeah. Like a virologist deriving a vaccine from a virus, I seek to derive mysticism from madness, transcendence from trauma. Mm -hmm. um, what have you derived or gained these past two years mm -hmm. during this pandemic? I have, I, I go by going back to survival, I have survived. Uh, this has been, I wanted to be productive. I know some of you have learned new languages and picked up instruments and God bless you. As we, as we say, bless your heart in the South. But um, I, I did not pick up any new languages or instruments or anything. I just survived. Um, and that I told myself that was enough. And I'm slowly getting back to work. I'm slowly writing again, which is great. Uh, but I also like, I'm a lot slower than I wish I was. And patience is a, a big issue for me. I'm not very good at it. Uh, but that's, I mean, this, this reminder to slow down and also like this notion of like when, so my book had just come out and then it was March, 2020 is when my book came out. So right, right at the beginning. Um, and it was perfect time. It was the beloved's timing is better than mine. That's how I see it. But, um, and it was perfect timing for that. And, and in the book, my dad talks about how humans are tiny and we think we're so big and a little virus could take us out. Um, I literally like that's in the book. Uh, and yeah, talk, and, and he's always said that. I mean, it's true. I have a master's in public health. I studied this stuff. We, anybody who's in public health knows we've been waiting for this. Like this has been expected. This isn't like unexpected, um, especially the way that we're tearing down the planet. So of course, like we're making it so that these viruses can survive better um, and thrive because of our own stupidity. Uh, it is, I mean, it's, it's baffling that like in the middle of all of this that we would also be like, okay, well, let's also start wars and like, this is humans. Like we're, there's a virus killing us and we're like, let's, let's start wars. And for the record, like it was long before that, but it's interesting to me to watch what's happening in Ukraine. And like every day I open the New York times and that is the first thing I see. And I just imagine like what would have been different if every day we'd been reading that about Yemen, uh, uh, for all the people who have died in Yemen and that we've been, we pay, we sold the weapons to Saudi Arabia to do that. Um, and they're still, we're fine with selling weapons for them to do that. And that like the, I, it's baffling to me too. And it's not, I mean, I should be used to it, but, um, and I, you know, God bless the Ukrainian people. I just, it's, I, it's typical. I should, I should expect it by now, but I want better for this country. And that like the current book that I'm working on is a love slash hate letter to America. Um, and <laughs> And it's just like, I want you to grow up. I want you to be better than this. Like you can be better than this. And I believe we can be so much better than this. Melody, your passion is infectious. 
Um, and uh, I'm just so grateful to have this conversation with you, to get to know you. Um, we will see you soon, um, but I'm gonna give this back to Brad uh, so we can continue with the vigil. Um, thank you again, merci. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Andy. What a wonderful conversation. Uh, and Melody, so, so, so just inspiring and, and meaningful. And just to say, I mean, the America that we're creating together here, this America loves you. Uh, so, so thank you so much for- I love you back. Thank you so much for that. All right, see, America's getting better one <laughs> room at a time, one vigil at a time. And, and, and with that, you know, I, I want to, we're, we're, we're moving from, from the section we were just in and we're moving toward uh, our honor ceremony. And we talk about acts of, of service in the area of our pain, of our loss. Uh, that, that's what, we, what Melody just shared with us in some ways about her teaching in, in, in the psychiatric uh, wards. And we, out of loss, have an opportunity for an act of service here together by honoring um, those that we've lost, that might be considered an act of service. And I think our definition of what service means can also be expanded in, in the world. And so together here today, we are uh, engaging in an act of service by being here for and with one another. And, and with that, I, I want to welcome uh, Jenny Diltz. Uh, Jenny is a certified grief coach and an active reimagined collaborator and event host. She's the founder of grievingcoach.com and the host of a wonderful podcast, Share Your Story, Exploring Humanity, One Soul at a Time. She, and this is what's so powerful, I mean, Jenny, you just blow our, our minds constantly. We, we, we know her with these wonderful uh, art in the background that she painted. And, um, and she has three reimagined events coming up this very week. Is that correct? Um, so I have one on Friday and one on Monday. In the next week, you have Managing Grief in the Workplace. If I'm not oh, mistaken. right. Building, I do have three, so yeah. Resilience through yoga and share your story. And so, yeah. you know, in our community, we invite people, any of you out there to host programs, to create programs for your community. And we try to help provide that platform and that inspiration that, and, and bring some community to those experiences to the extent that we can. And Jenny has been really a flagship uh, collaborator with Reimagine. That's what it means in our minds to collaborate, to work together, to spread this message that we're co-creating here with a lot more people. And so we wanted to invite Jenny as we have the spot in our vigils uh, for a community-based intention, if you will, and uh, as we lead into the uh, honor ceremony. And so Jenny, I wanna turn it over to you to share um, something that you have for us here. Thank you, Brad. And thank you, Melody, for sharing your story with us. Um, so much of your story resonates with me. I also had a mystic manic, mystic manic experience that lasted 24 hours. I was in the psych unit in the hospital um, and medication brought me down and connected me with the world that I'm living in. Um, not, not necessarily by choice, but like with you, it was needed and I've learned a lot from that experience. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I met some mystics in there too. Um, so mental health is a very special condition. And I think we as a society, we as a people don't give it enough credit. Um, and I wanted to also share a, one of my favorite Rumi poems, and you guys touched on it already. Um, it's not, probably not as tr well translated as you would, Melody, but I'm going to read it anyways. It's the guest house. It's a pretty famous one. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. 
he may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And to me, grief is one of these guests. I consider grief to be an honored guest, in fact. Um, but it hasn't always been that way for me. I had some vague awareness of grief, but no real concept of what it was because I had never lost anybody. I hadn't experienced the death of a close loved one. But through my training and professional work, I've come to realize that grief is more than just the pain of death. Grief is the natural and involuntary response to a loss of attachment. Um, so in my life, grief came as the dismissal from my graduate program and the identity shift that followed. It's holding space for the suffering of others in nature. And grief met me when I returned home from the psych unit and tried to make sense of it all. Regardless of how hard or messy things got, I've come to realize grief as a great mentor, teaching me many valuable lessons. I feel like I have a wonderful relationship with grief and often personify this universal component of humanity. I recognize that not everyone has the same relationship with her that I do. Often when grief comes to our door, it's unexpected and out of our control. We try to avoid her at all costs and push her away when she does get close. While she may be a companion, she's usually not a favored one. Society has given her a costume of dark, solemn, doom and gloom. But what if that's not who grief really is? As we learn more about her, we begin to see a complexity and a depth that we hadn't recognized before. We start to acknowledge that a visitor is knocking on our door. Eventually, we decide to open the door a crack to see who's on the other side. We see that grief is not as scary and ominous as legend says. We open the door a little wider to get a better view. She says, hello, Jenny, I have something to teach you. Are you ready to learn? If we answer no, she leaves with a promise to return again later. But if we are ready to learn, we begin to see that we are not alone in this journey with grief. We find others who have walked with her. Our stories and circumstances may not be the same, but we have all been affected by loss and with loss comes grief. We start to not only build connections with others in grief, but we begin to reconnect our, with ourselves and what's important to us. As we pay more attention to our souls, our heart, mind, body, and spirit, we learn how grief communicates with us, what we instinctively do when she comes and how we can intentionally respond to her invitations. In his book, Losing Faith, Finding Hope, Jesse Cruz shares, I know we all carry some form of grief with us. If we don't grieve properly, the weight of that grief becomes unmanageable. The added weight of a bad decision is more difficult to carry, but when grief is carried in healing, it creates new strength in our character. Sometimes still our response is no, and that's okay. Other times we're ready to go on a walk with grief. When she knocks, we invite her in and we ask, what do you have for me today? We can even be excited about the things she will show us, knowing that they bring some new delight. A once feared enemy has become a dear friend and we actually look forward to the adventures we'll have together, even when they're still painful. When we develop a positive relationship with grief, and as we continue in that work, we can be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. May we all continue to develop our relationship with grief and carry it in healing for ourselves and for those around us. Jenny, that was exquisite. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Honestly, I'm still, I'm, my body's still resonant with the chills uh, for what you shared and also just the way you shared it. Uh, it. It really is everything that we're 
we're trying to create together in, in that invitation that you talk about and the reminder of all the ways, all, all the different losses, all the ways that, you know, we don't, it doesn't just have to be about death as you, like the big death, there's little deaths and, and there's opportunities for that grief and for that love and that connection um, all the time. And so just grateful for, for, for you.